To begin analyzing our last algorithm, let's try to determine what data structure will be helpful here. The helpful data structure is going to be one where we can easily access the minimum and where we can easily update the cost associated with the vertices. So we want to be able to extract the minimum and be able to adjust the cost being stored in our data structure. Do we have any data structure that does that? Yes, we do. Our priority queue, a minimum priority queue, does exactly that. So let's look at some methods and remind us of what those were. Here I have a nice table with a bunch of minimum priority queue methods. Here we have an initialization method, an insert method, an extract max method. All of those are what you might expect. What we are storing in this minimum priority queue is an object X, meaning a vertex, and the key for that vertex, meaning the cost at that vertex. So we're not just storing numbers in this minimum priority queue, but we're storing an object and its key, meaning the cost. That being said, all of these methods, insert and extract, we studied before. Those all take log of s time, where s is the size of the priority queue. Then we can also, in our maximum priority queue, our max heap that we looked at, we could decrease the key at a particular location in log of s time. We may need to do that when updating the cost of various vertices. And then we have a bunch of methods that we haven't talked about, but you might expect to exist in an object such as this. Things like, is it empty? Is it not empty? Does it contain something? What is the value of a key? And what is the minimum key? There are a couple of these, it's not obvious. Uh, we can do them in constant time. So if we look, is empty and is not empty? That should be easy. You can just have a Boolean being stored if you wanted, or you could have some other way to check that. And contains, that, <laughs> That doesn't seem very obvious at all that we can do that in a constant time. But the way we can do this is by creating a secondary array where each entry in the array is the location of vertex in the priority queue. And because the vertices are numbered, v1, v2, v3, v4, v5, we store them in that numerical order. So we store the location of V1 somewhere in here. When we perform all of our methods, we also need to update these locations. We're not gonna go through all of that. That would be very tedious, but you, we just store this additional information. And by doing so, we can then determine if we contain a particular vertex in constant time, convenient. Similarly, to get the key associated with an object, we would again do that random access lookup in this array to determine the location, then use that location to index it into the min heap that we are storing everything else in. So. To determine the key, again, we can do that in constant time by using this array. And then to determine the minimum key without extracting it, we do that by just accessing the first element of the minimum heap. So all that's straightforward. Now, how can we use this in our code? Well, let's go down and look at it. This should be very similar to our previous example, just more object oriented. Rather than having this data structure U, we now have a priority queue called Q that we are going to store all of these costs in. So we initialize the priority queue. We then insert every single element into the priority queue, every single vertex with a cost of infinity. The second entry, that is the cost for the vertex. And we are going to then insert V1 with a cost of zero, just like we saw before. And then we're gonna say its parent is going to be null. And then just like we saw before, just more object oriented in its writing, we're going to go so long as Q is not empty and so long as the minimum key is an infinity, the exact same as it was before, just written into different notation here. And those methods have, might have different runtimes in the ways we were looking at it before. We then extract the minimum and assign the parentage. All of this code, just like in our previous example, is making the greedy decision, greedy decision. Let's maybe highlight that in a color so we can analyze it later. I believe in our last example, we used dark green. So let's do that again. And then for every single edge, incident on V sub J, the thing we just added, we're going to update it. So for every single edge, I believe we highlighted this in lavender last time, if I remember correctly. So let's do the same thing for every single edge. If the 
Q contains V sub K, so we haven't added it to the minimum spanning tree yet. Remember, Q is the edges that need to be added still. In our examples, we've used that to be the white nodes in the graph. So if V sub K still needs to be added, and the weight we just found is less than the key, then we would need to decrease the key for V sub K and update the parentage, just like we saw before. It's just a more efficient way of storing this data and accessing the data, but it is exactly the same as before. It remains to be seen, what is the runtime? For this code up top here, this code, lines three through five, well, that first run is going to have one element in the priority queue, and then two elements in the priority queue, and then all the way up until we have n elements in the priority queue, we have seen this exact summation, the sum of logs, where we're increasing the value by one a bunch of times. I'm not going to go through it here, but this code is in theta of n log n. Notice that's actually worse than our previous code. Why is that? Well, because insertion no longer takes constant time. Our previous example was more akin to having an unsorted array implementation of a minimum priority queue. Here we are having a heap implementation and therefore we have logarithmic runtimes. So by doing insertions, those are more expensive in a minimum heap priority queue than they are in an unsorted array priority queue. We therefore increase the runtime of that code. Now, conveniently, this takes constant time and that takes constant time we already talked about. How long does it take to extract the minimum? Well, to extract the minimum, lines nine through 10, or just line nine, costs log of s time. And I know what the size of q does. I'm at every single instance extracting one element. So the runtime there would be the sum from s equals n down to one of c log of s, which is equal to the sum from s equals one to n of c log of s which again, we've seen the summation a quadrillion times in this class that is in theta of n log n. And that's for every single run. So that is for the entire while loop. Because again, we are extracting one element every single time and we're doing it until it is empty. The part that looks a bit tricky is, huh, here. Let's begin with the body. The body of that loop, this stuff here, that's going to be calling contains, that's constant time, and key, that's constant time, but it might call decrease key. So this is going to take log of s time in general. And how many times does that run? Well, this is going to run for each edge incident on v sub j. So those are lines 11 through 16. Lines 11 through 16 cost the sum from j equals, let's do i or k to make it similar. We'll do k equals one to the degree of v sub j of c log of s. Notice it doesn't necessarily always take log of s time, but eh, close enough. So this equals the degree C times the degree of V sub J times log of S. Notice K didn't appear anywhere in here. So nice and easy summation. And now what happens to the size and the degree? Well, we have that the total runtime is going to be the sum from J equals one to N of C times the degree of V sub J times log of S. To bound this above, let's bound this above by replacing log of S with log of N. And we have C times the degree of V sub J times log of N. And then this is less than or equal to C times two M times log of N. And it's not necessarily obvious how you'd bound this below, but let's not bother with that too much right now. The runtime here is going to be theta of, well, line nine took n log n time. 
And then logs 11, lines 11 through 16 took m times log of n time. Maybe we could write that as theta of n plus m times log of n. And that is a reasonable way to represent this runtime. The question now becomes, is this better than our previous implementation? Well, let's check. Remember that m is can be up to n squared. So this could be an n squared log of n. What was our previous runtime again? n squared in the worst case. Oh, interesting. So this, our, this algorithm is not necessarily better than this algorithm here. And that can occur if at every single step we needed to update keys a whole, 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 whole bunch here on this lines here. That is not very common and it is very uncommon that you have a, a complete graph. So it's unlikely that M will be quite so large as that. So this will typically be better than the previous algorithm. As we've seen several times, we made the algorithm more efficient in some sense by using a data structure with ideal properties for the problem to solve the particular hurdle that we needed to overcome, which was finding a minimum and changing the values within the data structure in a relatively efficient way. And the relatively efficient way here is in logarithmic time.